just like some kind of like animation magic that I actually experienced. In 3D, how we make it is very similar to the live action camera, except there's no weather, there's no people walking around in the set, there's no logistics, it's awesome. I think I arrived in animation scene in a really great time where we stopped asking about if that is 2D or if it is 3D. You can just merge everything, who cares, as long as you can tell the story. My favorite thing about animation is the fact that we think like an artist. You want to create something beautiful. In the reality, you work like a soldier. And then it's like, go, 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 go. I do so many crazy stuff in 3D, but actually I really like 2D too. So why not just like actually finally see how 2D people do it? And do you prefer the 2D world? Hi. <laughs> uh... Hey, Kaya, your backdrop looks awesome. Ah, it's like a little, <laughs> it's very chaotic, but like your backdrop is awesome too, with so many toys, it seems super, super lots fun. Lots of toys, lots of Spider-Mans. Have you seen the new Spider-Man movie? Not yet, I really have to watch it. I'm sitting on two cushions, so that I don't make myself taller, because I'm like really tiny, and it would be like this, hi. <laughs> In the lower thirds. I'm Kai Yulang, and uh, I originally from Hong Kong. After A level in Hong Kong, I just backpack and then I travel a bit, like a gap year. And then at a time, like some friends already studying in Europe, tell me like in Europe, you know, like the university, you can just try to go in. At the beginning, I arrived in Paris, so I, I was accepted in uh, Sorbonne for like fine arts. So basically, it's like uh, art philosophy and art history. But the first year. I kind of feel like I don't really see myself in it for a long time and uh, I know I always wanted to do cinema so like I just go to went to volunteer in uh, ANSI festival it's a, an animation festival and I was like okay I think that's what I want to do now like it's just so cool to see like so many people doing making films in like a million ways and then I met a lot of filmmakers and then the way they approach their work and their craft they articulate a lot of stuff that I always feel like I want to say and somehow they help me to say it. Like they, they don't just like speak uh, to me, but they speak for me. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I gonna, I gonna try to do animation. So I get into Super Focom out. Now it's called Ergo Moba, it's like 3D school. I make uh, the graduation film Louis Shoes. And then uh, I graduated during COVID. And then like I've been working now as a freelance director and also a lighting and compositing artist in studio for like two, three years. And then here we are. We're going to talk about the Mango Cult project, of course, but I'd love to talk a little bit about Louis Shoes because I absolutely love it. Ah, thank you. Was it just a small team? Yeah, so it's a really small team because like in our graduation film, normally there's like six people and you know, like uh, we group together. But like us, we are like four people. I love it because each of us like have a very specific thing we want to concentrate. For example, I, I want to do storyboarding and like the um, concept of it and also the lighting, compositing like the end of it. So I'm the, the beginning and the end. And then like some people specifically want to do like rigging and animation. Some people do. I, I feel like we can move like a raptor, you know, instead of yeah. like a T-Rex and then like, a, you know, you, you move very slow. Okay, you have a big jar, but very slow. But for us, we are really light on our feet. We know exactly what we gonna do and then we complement each other really well. How long did that project take to do? I think it's like eight months. It's like one semester. That was uh, pretty crazy because like in the middle of it, it was just like this COVID. So we just pack everything. And then the good thing is we li all live in a small town in France. So even though it's locked down, but we live really close. And then it makes you feel grateful to do animation because like imagine it's live action is crazy. That's uh, crazy to experience such like, you know, working on a project and then COVID happens. So there's four people on that project because it's such a great finished product and like the behind the, behind the scenes, the style. Can you just talk about how you all together as a four came up with kind of everything really from story to style? At the very beginning, we kind of try to lock down the theme of the movie. But whenever we have like any kind of problem artistically or technically where we need to cut time or save money shot or something like that, we always go back to the theme because it's a perspective of a kid. Like we have a lot of characters in the movie, but like we only show like, like not the face at all because 
he's like a, a little kid who don't want to look at people's face. We, we look for some keywords, the story that we want to convey. And then most of the, the time, um, all the decision you can like directly answer by those keywords. Like the, the kid don't look at people's face, so we can save all the time for all the hair and everything. Yeah. And efficiency. Efficiency. Yeah. I mean, that is a good thing about animation too. Like when I, when I make it, I just think about like how to save stuff, how to, the logistic part, you Absolutely. know, how to cheat. The whole story is because we, we did like interview to like a lot of autistic child and then people their own experience, the little anecdote, and then we just chain them together and then put that like in one day of this kid, like the background and all this, the setup and everything. It is like just to tell one anecdote, no matter what decision, you always respect the story. So like, for example, my personal work. Probably the style is very different from this film because I always do black and white, you know, like 2D, 3D mix. But we definitely know this render is the perfect for this story about a kid. He see the world like this because it's about like social life and social interaction. So it's like a social theater. You know, all the behind the scenes stuff where you've got like all the assets and the props kind of laid out on like a they're like a cutting board as if it's made as like a stop motion like theater yeah yeah physical physical pieces that's a great thing in 3d like you can always when i work i always like you know i make the set and everything and then there's one moment maybe three in the morning you're tired and then i just zoom out zoom out zoom out zoom out zoom out and i just see it i was like ah it's mine you know if you're already a part of our incredible community, thank you so much and it really means the world to us. But if you're new here and you've been watching the content for a while and you haven't hit that subscribe button, we would really appreciate it if you could just take a second to do so. In return, we promise to keep creating, improving and bringing you bigger and better content. Now back to the episode. So I guess we can um, move on to the, the Male Mango Cult project, you know, a great hybrid of 3D, 2D. Can you tell us about how that came about originally? Actually, it's from uh, Studio um, Tech Talk because they have like, um, you know, animation studio on their own and then they have like a lot of really, really great shots. And uh, at the beginning, actually, I knew them like when I was a student because um, I knew them from Festival, actually. And then I just present myself, my work, and then they're always looking for artists. So when I was in school, I was already working for them. They're really great for young artists who try to have like a playground, a sandbox to see what you can do. And also what happened to Hong Kong during like 2019, the protests. And I always feel like I want to talk about something. And somehow they contact me to say that like, hey, we have like a piece of like a Chinese history. Do you want to like, you know, try it out to see if you want to do something? And I was like, really? Absolutely, for sure. So when you get the green light to go ahead, let's talk about the process from pretty much like a timeline of development to, to finish will be great. So the whole process is pretty short and sweet. It's like uh, three, four months with the retake and everything. There's already a script and then like, you know, there's some from refinement with it. When I see the gist of it and I immediately do the research. At the very beginning, I already inspired by a lot of like, um, you know, like a newspaper photo or historic photo at the time. Okay, I want to do something that inspired from those like propaganda poster at the time. So there's a lot of like paper texture and it's like harsh light, you know, like those old and um, communist poster is all that kind of printing. Yeah. So it's like harsh light, uh, white, black and red. It's very visually striking. The whole story is how people can behave extremely in an extreme environment. Eventually, they don't even know who they are anymore. So like, you can definitely go to a route that is like very puppetry. When you know what is the animation that you're going to do, you can know what kind of cheating you can do. And then like I storyboard it and also lay out it at the same time. Then I know exactly how many scenes I'm going to do. So like I just look for all the free assets. Actually, a lot of animation is from Misamu. Yeah, we love that. We love that. Oh, it's, yeah. yeah. It's, a bl it's amazing. I just like do that, do that, grab that. And then I reanimate it and reanimate it a little bit. And I change it. Uh, the, like the, the, the face, the head, head, I always like do like, a, you know, like a blend shape. I always more pay attention on the framing and also composition instead of just animation by themselves. I choose the master short, of course, to see. I, I try to experiment the visual style, like from head to finish, like as much as possible in those like maybe four master short. And then I already have the pipeline of it. And then the rest of the shot, yeah, you just like go like that. Even though there's a lot of variation or whatsoever, but at least you have the base lockdown. Out of interest, do you or have you ever used Blender? Yes. Yes. Because that's got a really nice grease pencil, the 2D, 
the 3D. What's your sort of thoughts and feelings on, on Blender and how do you use it in your process? What? Blender, I'm like really, really early, like uh, getting into it because like uh, in Mango Code, I definitely use more Blender. I think Blender is like definitely um, something I want to do more. Every time I do a project, I kind of have a little goal. And then the next goal for me is I'm going to do everything in Blender just to see if I can do the stuff that I'm doing only one software. The thing is, I really like the episode with uh, Will Anderson. Because I really like this guy. Oh, he is an absolute legend, Will Anderson. Absolutely. Ah, first, I love his yeah. work. I can't wait to see more of the stuff that he's going to do later. And then it's really, really great. He's just really open and honest. Like, yeah. you know, I don't want to animate, you know, and I can't model yeah. the way he sort of decides to use like geometry nodes and ways to kind of do the animation for him, almost puppeteering the characters in the computer what software are we talking for certain parts of this for example well like storyboard is storyboard pro and then like uh later it's like maya i don't know render with the a lot of blender but blender i just do a lot of like readjustment of the object and modeling you know a little bit texturing and scrubbing because it's like a black and white 2d thing so a lot of the you know the the, the texture is just you know unwrap you will put it on photoshop it and then and like some um some sust substance painter and then like the compositing part is all after effects what was the trickiest shot and what was the absolute headaches when creating this piece oh my god uh, the, the trickiest shot the rope part like i cannot cheat it they are moving so i have to like do that <laughs> like like there's not something that i can cheat with just like in mapping or like camera tracking Another one is the, there's a shot, it's like when the camera zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. That one, again, is something that I cannot cheat. I thought I can cheat, but actually, absolutely not. <laughs> and then... Were, uh, were there a ways that you thought, this is going to be a bit tricky. What other ways can I do it without doing it? Yeah. Or was that like, I've got to, I've got to face the music here, I've got to do it. You've got to face the music. Yeah, I, like, um, first, like, there's a lot of like, uh, because at the beginning, I thought I can just like make a stand, stand in of stuff. And then later, I realized when I drive the camera, if I really want to make it horrible and impressive there still have a lot of like perspective in it but at the same time there's still a lot of rope around it so i was like wow <laughs> and again because the camera is like doing that so i cannot cheat it that was so uh, i think that is the hardest part but i really love the results of it worth the pain yeah worth the pain so yeah <laughs> what was the biggest thing that, that you learned from doing this type of project and this project in particular because like in 3D, there's so many steps in it. So you can easily suck into just like unwrapping the perfect UV. And then eventually unwrap it and you realize like, you know what? Like you're... You don't even see it. I don't even need... <laughs> you don't even see it, man. Like all you turn it, but eventually you want to do some kind of like, you know, focus. Once you do the lighting, you, you do the all the compositing part of it. And then you kind of know what you need to do. So that's somehow actually save you so much time. That's also the worst way to learn and also best way to learn. Because if you want to know the pipeline correctly, you do everything perfectly. But if you have all the time in your world. But I personally always feel like you should do stuff that in the fastest way possible. Because you always do shit at the beginning. And then the second part for personal note is like when you're working in one thing and then you just really tunnel vision. It is not a good thing mental health wise and also the body wise. It really take a toll off you. The, the harder that I work, the harder I would just like go to the gym and I just work out and sweat it out. And, you know, when you work in animation, even though it's perfect because like nobody disturbed you and there's no physical environment or something, but it's definitely not good for mental health. And uh, that's something that I learned a lot in this project too. You know, especially with people working on personal projects or big projects, it takes a toll phys physically, mentally, and how important it is to look after yourself as number one first. It's a really serious sort of side of the industry. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's great to highlight it and talk about it. The funny thing is like the more I work in this industry, the more I think artists and athlete is very similar. Like you are as good as your last season. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. I love to watch like a sports documentary and stuff like that. And I don't know why I always like very drag into that world. The work that I do, I definitely feel like I'm, a, I'm an athlete. I'm like, there's a sportsmanship in it. Maybe sometime is uh, like a, just a one person sport, like swimming. Maybe sometime when you're in a studio work or project is a basketball. You have to game it out. Filmmaking in a way is very cruel. Like just like athlete who 
win the game. They win it. And then suddenly next season, maybe he cannot win it. It is just sportsmanship, you know, it's just the way it is. And just like, you know, filmmaking, you can make a really good film. You can make a really bad one, but you like it constantly. You have to remind yourself, I like it, but now it's my job. How can I balance it? There's a competition with other people, but also yourself. How can you remind yourself to love it? I think that's one of the reasons why I feel sport can definitely help me to release my stress in my in the artistic career of it. Have you seen the Michael Jordan um, documentary of... The Last Dance! Dude, of course I see it! <laughs> that is insane, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. When did you land in the 3D world? It is really weird. Because like most of the people around me, they always say that like, oh, ever since I was a kid, I love 3D animation or like I love animation, that kind of stuff. And then for me, because at the beginning, I just study like like philosophy and art history. So I completely, I don't even have my own computer, to be quite honest at the time. I met some people who make some animation. And then I, I get to know a little bit more in 3D. And uh, I personally, I'm very inspired by in the live action camera and also the lighting in 3D, how we make it is very similar to the live action camera, except like, but like we have the virtual setting that is completely like free. And then like, there's no weather, there's no people walking around in the set. There's no logistic. It's awesome. And yeah. then uh, I was like, wow, you cannot beat this kind of liberty. Right. Yeah. And then it's like full control of whatever full you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always inspired by a lot of those classical movie, like those like awesome Wales, Billy Wilders, like the composition they made and the 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 light and then how they carve off the scene and everything and then this is like very close to 3D animation and that's why immediately I just start with um, 3D during the time and my friend was like I didn't know that you you like Pixar and I was like mm, yeah I like them but actually there's so much more thing that you can do I think I arrived in animation scene in a really great time where we stop asking about if that is 2D or if it is 3D, you can just merge everything. Or in the middle, you can add a stop motion. Who cares? As long as you can tell the story. My favorite thing about animation too is the fact that we, you think like an artist, you want to create something beautiful. But in reality, you work like a soldier. You are in a military time. Like, because I study in fine art, like when you do the painting, illustration is somehow like something more romantic. And it's like you, you, you summoned a kind of inner goddess and then you just draw with inspiration. Like in animation too, you you have like the, the inspiration, you try to make it something beautiful and artistic. But your inner goddess is like, you know, full gear, you know, like you have to notice everything. And then it's like, go, 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 go. And then you're fighting one thing at a time. Like, especially coming from a fine art background, when we were talking about Spider-Man, merging all these styles together, and there's no real rule to each frame. Yeah, absolutely. Something like Spider-Verse, they have crazy different kind of stuff, but you can tell like the filmmaker found a visual grammar like there's a logic in it and everything works with the theme or with what they want to say everything is calculated i love to watch like when a director know what they're doing and then manipulate you like I, I suck it in and i just like you know like just like control me like tell me about when to feel it or something like that it's really great yeah there's so much detail and calculated like purpose for every decision but at the same time it looks so crazy like a mismatch of everything, but it's so controlled at the same time. Yeah, it's just like a perfect, beautiful manipulation of cinema. It's great. Getting into the 3D world, that was kind of your in. Where did you sort of explore and end up in the, the 2D world? And do you prefer the 2D world? Uh, hey. or... <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, both, I love it. For 2D now, it's actually, it's just like a really pure by chance. The studio is really great. It's called Bobby Peels in Paris. And then they have been making a lot of stuff, animation that I love. I just feel like I should come out from the 2D closet. Cause like I do so many crazy stuff in 3D, but actually I really like 2D too. So why not just like actually finally see how 2D people do it? So this project is Blood Dragon make, remakes uh, Captain Laser Hack. People who work in 2D studio, they are like a monstrous draftman. Like they, the way they draw is crazy. 
the compositing I do is definitely very different from 3D. But actually, again, there's a lot of things that's very common. The sensibility about the painting, the lighting, and then the integration of image. The show is from uh, 80s uh, video game. It's actually an entity from Ubisoft and also a Netflix show. And then uh, it's completely 2D. And like it, actually, at the very beginning, why it attract me on the show is the fact that like it reminds me a lot like those like old kung fu Hong Kong movies. Like it's also self-aware. It is like an action show, and uh, it is very different from what I do. So many things that I didn't know in animation that is supposed to know, but like to make the frame very very short, and then to create an action that is like it feels very long, and then it's just like some kind of like animation magic that I actually experience in this two D show. And also like there's a, a lot of code that is from like a old Asian Japanese animation because like it's the that era. So very limited animation, but also uh, very effectively telling a story. Decoration, the lighting, everything is really, really amazing. And then like, it's a great reinterpretation of a game that a lot of people loved before. Yeah, I, I'm really happy to work on this. Th th this show is really, really great. What about advice for getting into the industry? I think one of the biggest advice, I don't think it's just for the director, but like, I think creating your own stuff outside your career is definitely the most important. I think your portfolio is your best currency. And so because Louis Shoes, uh, we got the student Oscar and then it was just awesome. But like, again, after I have the award, I definitely think that like, um, seriously, is that really, am I really deserve to have it? So immediately I just like want to do Mango Cult. I just want to see if I can actually do a short film on my own. Like I, it's a, like a, a thing, you know? You just do your own stuff and you try to find your own voice and your own language. And I've worked for Vogue and then I work for Tech Talk and then I work for this thing and that thing. And now I'm doing 2D and then like later, maybe next next thing I do another stuff. And I think that's the best way to reinvent yourself so that you don't actually only trap in one thing. And eventually, even though you love that thing, you 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 will you will burn out. You just don't know what you're doing. Imagine you do basketball like a thousand times. You don't know what you are anymore. Eventually, you define by you define it by if you can win the season, which is kind of sad. No, that's great. That's a great piece of advice. What was it like seeing your work at a festival? Go into the event. I'm pretty harsh on myself. So like when I go see the like all my film in a really big screen. Oh, I can see. You sit there like this. It's like, oh yeah, it. oh my God, everybody know I'm a fraud. <laughs> you know, I'm an imposter, I knew it, you know. Because you, you actually see all the little things that nobody else sees and you kind of go, yeah, oh, yeah. that rend... Yeah, 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 yeah. You can hear, like, for example, like in the cinema place, it's like a pro professional sound system thing, but you deep down, you know, I do the sound on my own and it's actually <laughs> like, oh no, it's horrible. First is I'm at, what deep down I'm really proud that I can see it on big screen and then and the thing is you can directly talk to the audience, uh, what they feel about it. I actually met a lot of like Chinese or Asian uh, filmmaker. They tell me like they have no idea that happened. Uh, the mango thing is is the thing at the time. And then I was like, yeah, it's crazy. And then we talk about our our journey. And then it I for me when I make this film go to the festival. Actually, it's not really just to see my film. Most of the time is I just want to go there for free. <laughs> and... Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, Who hell doesn't? yes. That's, yeah, and then that's, like, the real, that's the real reason. That's the real reason. And then <laughs> to actually meet different kind of people there. And then like you feel legitimized and or like you, you feel proper to talk with those people. Another cool thing about in Festival is like how people are super famous. But they just don't like, especially in animation, man, like they, they, you cannot see their face most of the time. So they just chill as hell and then actually stress me out a little bit because it happens so many times that I, I talk to that person and that person is just like, you know, oh, actually uh, it's an industry giant or something. <laughs> and I always like make a metaphor. It's like when I go to a festival, it's like, you know, in those like old Kung Fu movie, like you arrive in front of a temple and there's like an old guy swiping the floor. And then later you realize this is a Kung Fu master, but you have no idea. <laughs> like, so at the beginning, I just don't feel like um, I'm actually in this world. So I just try to talk to people and just see what they are doing, just out of curiosity. And uh, that's how I uh, deal with my imposter syndrome. I feel like uh, as long as you have the curiosity to share and to talk with other people, to learn from them, or like, you know, I, for me, I always feel like, okay, you feel like imposter, 
imposter, but that's okay. Yeah. You're here to steal shit. <laughs> I'm here Absolutely. to steal all the stuff. It's funny that you say steal things because I think really everybody that's making anything, when, when you're sitting with a director and they go, oh, you know what, this shot, I want it to just look like that shot from Blade Runner or, you know, everything's borrowed and passed around and changed and tweaked to make it their own. But Yeah, so like sometimes when I watch a film, I will go back and then I will try to draw the storyboard of it to see how they exactly do it to make me have this emotion, which is like a very classic practice. You, you, you kind of want to, like, like you watch it, you suck in in the story, but at the same time, you kind of watch it with another perspective. Like, let me see how you do it. But the film is so good that you completely forget about the reference. I hope one day I can do that. I hope one day, like, I, I have, like, a lot of tools in my back and I, I steal so many people's stuff. But, like, at the end, I can mix them together and then people just forgot to ask, like, what is my reference or how I made it. Can you tell us how your, your mother explains to people what you do for a living? Yeah. <laughs> Can you let the viewers know how she describes your craft? So basically, I kind of, I, I, my mom had no idea about how, what I'm doing. I just like work in the computer. And so I just tell her like, you know, like uh, in studio, I work in like lighting compositing, right? So like uh, it's a uh, 3D and then so like you make a puppet, you put the stick in the puppet and then you move it. And then my mom was like, so you're making puppet show for a living. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly. And you know what? I'm not even the one <laughs> who animated. I'm just like, you know, filming the puppet. She was just like, wow, I can't, oh, the world changed a lot. I can't believe people make a living out of it. Because like, the, and also when you are a kid or something, you watch Pixar or like those like it looks for outsider. It looks so abstract. You just have no idea how people make those image. And then so my mom was just, didn't realize like oh okay so like that's what you're doing is like a is a puppet show but like and now people don't do puppet puppet but like they put it in a computer and i was like exactly that's what i do that's a great great understanding of what you do what yeah you which do. is true like it's just like a <laughs> that has been an incredible chat and i, and I just want to thank you so much for your time um Kayu. Rest of the day, what's what's planned? Are you back to work or are you up? Yeah, actually, uh, I just come back from this festival and then I, I had a cold, so I'm kind of recovering oh, from really? it. Actually, uh, yeah, I have some like personal project that I want to do immediately because that's a good thing from the festival is like you see so many people and they really get inspired and, and also you kind of do some kind of report on yourself, what you're good at or not good at. And you try to, you know, you know, do it again, you know. Whatever your project you're working on, I mean, we'd love to see it in the future. We'll check back in. Thank you so much. And yeah, please stay in touch because it's been it's been great to to chat with you, Kayo. Thank you so much. That's so awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kayo, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Take care.